Happy Easter. Welcome. Um, so I didn't study at all today so, or this week, so I just need you to help me out a little bit. I know that on Friday Jesus died on a cross, but I forgot what happens uh, three days later. Uh, so if anybody wants to help me out with that. Um, anybody remember? Oh, good. Somebody knows. Oh, praise God. Welcome to church. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, so uh, my point is, is we aren't trying to reinvent the wheel here today at Roots Church. We're not trying to be slick or clever. Um, we are here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as a church, uh, we want to make that clear um, right out the gate. So if you're new, you understand that, that we are a church that believes in the authority of Scripture. We teach the Bible every single week here. It's far less about what we think and what we believe and far more about what uh, God thinks and God says uh, through His Word. So let's pray. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 23. If you don't have a Bible, and you have, maybe you have one on your phone, uh, there are Bibles, should be in the chairs in front of you. Um, and if you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 23, we're going to be at the end of the chapter there. So let's pray. Let's commit this time to the Lord, and, and let's worship Him through His Word. Father, thank You for Your Son, Jesus. <coughs> God, we thank you that you've given him to us as a gift, Lord, as a, a sacrifice for our sins, for our shortcomings. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together today, this morning, and celebrate the fact that you rose from the dead. And that we can glory in that this morning, that we could... Be a people who are not without hope, but a people who are very hopeful. Because we do not serve a God who is dead, but a God who is alive. And so we love you, Lord, and we ask that you would be here among us this morning, that you would speak clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So listen, I want you to just imagine something with me for a moment here this morning. Um, I want you to imagine that you uh, woke up one morning, and, and that morning was no different than any other morning you've ever experienced, right? You, you get up, you get dressed, you eat breakfast, and, and you're on your way to work. And let's just say you, like the disciples, were a fisherman. And so you head off to go fishing, and you get there, and um, it's hot, you're sweating, whether you like your job or not, it's neither here nor there. You're there, you're working, you're going about your business, nothing much has changed for you. And all of a sudden, you're approached by a man. And that man calls you to drop your nets and follow him. Let me translate that for you. Leave your livelihood, leave your career, and follow him. And he says something very curious like, um, I am going to make you a fisher of men. And you thought, well, this is a bit odd. You know, uh, normally, you'd, you'd, you'd think twice about something like this, right? Um, he's like, I don't know about all this kind of thing. Beat it, bro. This is New York City. It's just kind of like we get asked lots of crazy things all the time. A lot of things we hear are pretty crazy. But, but there was something different about this man. There was something different about this encounter. It was the way that he looked at you. It was the authority in his voice. There was something about this man. There was something different about this moment. And so you drop your nets, you leave it all, and you follow him. Half of you is thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> While the other half of you is captivated by this polarizing figure. And so then for the next three years, you would follow him countless miles on foot. You would watch him astound the religious people around you with his wisdom. Every time he opened his mouth to teach, you'd see people flock to him. There were people who traveled just to hear Jesus teach. Everything he said was perfect. Everything he did was perfect. And yet, he was without pride. 
As a matter of fact, he was the picture, the perfect picture of humility. He always put others before himself. The Bible says in the Gospel of John that this man, Jesus, always did what pleased the Father. You had never seen anybody so zealous to please God. As he walked among you, you watched over the years him heal cripples. You watched the lame walk. You watched the, the blind receive sight, the deaf receive hearing. There was something different about this man. The compassion that Jesus had was unlike any sort of compassion that you've ever experienced, ever seen in your entire life. Jesus Christ displayed the most incredible compassion towards those who were outcasts, towards those who were cast-offs, towards those who nobody wanted anything to do with. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel that way. Maybe you feel like a cast off. Maybe you feel unwanted. Maybe you have gone through some issues and some trials and tribulations among your own family and you kind of feel like nobody cares, like nobody loves you. And there's good news this morning. And that is that Jesus cares and Jesus loves you. And Jesus sees you. And you're the kind of person he hung out with while he was here on earth. Jesus touched the untouchable. Jesus sat with sinners. Jesus sat and ate and drank with people that nobody wanted anything to do with. And he was ridiculed for it. But he didn't care. Because the Bible says that Jesus came not for the, not for the, the well, but for the sick. Not for those who thought they were perfect and in need of nothing, but for those who knew that they had need of forgiveness, need of a Savior. And as time passed, you began to realize that this Jesus you were following was more than just a man. That He was the long-awaited Messiah. That this Jesus you were following was God incarnate. And so as the three years came to an end in your final moments, final days with Jesus... He prayed for you. And not only did He pray for you, but He instructed you. He said, listen, I'm going to go and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be put to death. But don't fear that because I'm going to prepare a place for you. Don't fear that because, listen, because it's better if I go because if I go, I will then send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God, to live inside you. So everything I've been teaching you and everything I've instructed you, He will empower you to live the life that I'm calling you to. See, that's the beautiful thing about Christianity. That's the beautiful thing about a relationship with God, walking with the Lord Jesus, is that He doesn't just instruct us with regards to how we should live, how we should act, how we should talk. But Philippians chapter 2 tells us that that He not only gives us the desires to live for Him, but He also gives us the power to do it. And so Jesus is saying, listen, have no fear. I'm going to death now, but it's better for you because I'm going to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to live in you, to empower you. And still, with all of that, even with His final words, you still could not wrap your mind around the fact that the perfect, sinless Son of God must be put to death, and not just any death, but the death of a criminal on the cross. And so we spoke about that on Good Friday, but today is a day for rejoicing. Today is not Friday, it's Sunday. See, because that day came, that Friday came, and that day was the most stressful, uh, anxiety-filled, tear-filled, heartbreaking day. The disciples were thrown for a loop. They, they were no doubt struggling with depression as you read the Gospels and you see the way that they reacted to the crucified Christ. It was a day that, that you thought would never end, but then... Luke chapter 23 happened. 
starting at verse 50. And now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. And he was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then he took it down and he wrapped it in a linen shroud. And he laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been laid. And it was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. And so the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and, set, and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Can you imagine what this period was like? Can you imagine having followed Jesus for three years and watching him turn water into wine and watching him multiply fish and loaves to feed thousands of people. And now that very same person, God in the flesh, has been put to death. And you're trying to figure out, well, what do we do now? Now we got we to gotta take him down and we got to wash his body and we got to wrap him in burial cloths and we got to go find a tomb to put him in. And is this happening? How is this happening? I thought, I mean, I saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Why? Why is he dead? I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand why this is happening. That, 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 that hopeless moment when the stone was rolled over the face of the tomb and the questions began to haunt you. Why? Why would this happen to him? How could this happen? What dinner must have been like that evening as you sit around the table dejected how somber those moments would have been. The three days between the crucifixion and resurrection. I mean, listen, their whole future and hope was pinned up in the person of Jesus. And he told them, I'm coming back on the third day. But that kind of went right over their heads, right? They're just kind of like, oh my gosh, the, the world's going to end. And, um, but what a difference three days makes. Friday was filled with devastation, but Sunday came in great joy. There was great joy. Luke chapter 24. It says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek... <laughs> this is classic, right? It's, it's, this is... Why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> he is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? Don't you remember that? Remember we he kind of did that Bible study? You guys, you didn't listen? No? Remember he told you while you were in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. Well, that's a nice story, Jimmy. And I'm glad you believe that because you seem pretty excited about it. But um, come on, man. That stuff really happen? I mean, I like, I like hashtag facts, okay? And so this whole thing, this is a great little cute story that I'm sure encourages you this time of year. Sure, it helps you through some hard times, but I want some hard uh, evidence. Listen, if you're a believer in the room today, praise God you're here uh, uh, because you're going to be strengthened and encouraged by what is said next. If you're a skeptic, an atheist, an agnostic, uh, you name it, you know, a nominal Christian, lukewarm, kind of one foot in the church, one foot out of the church, we're glad you're here too. I mean, I've, I've literally just prayed over this part um, of the study because um, I believe that this next portion of the study is going to be extremely encouraging for you and I. Because what we believe is not a fairy tale. What we believe is based on historical facts and evidence. And so uh, that said, uh, point uh, number one, Jesus' resurrection 
was prophesied over 300 years in advance. Isaiah chapter 53 is a chapter on uh, the suffering servant. And, and 300 years before this happened, Isaiah spoke of the Messiah which would come, the Messiah which would be rejected, the Messiah which would be beaten and murdered for our transgressions. And then he said he would raise again from the dead. 300 years before it happened. Prophecy confirming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A second point, Jesus foretold His resurrection. Not just once, not just twice. As I mentioned, numerous times throughout the gospel, Jesus told the disciples He was going to raise again from the dead. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man Jesus said, you can destroy this temple, but in three days it will rise again. Over and over again, Jesus instructed the disciples that, that he was going to conquer death. That they would put him to death, but he would raise again from the dead, even plainly said on the third day. Um, the third point, Jesus was put to death by professionals. This is important, right? Because there are certain people, there are skeptics who would say, well... I get it. Jesus, you know, rose again from the quote-unquote dead and a bunch of people saw him alive. So what if he just didn't die? What if he didn't die? And then that kind of refutes the whole resurrection thing. No, no, no. Listen, he was put to death by professionals. By professionals who made sure when they killed somebody, they were flatlined. That there was no more breath within him. He was killed by a professional executioners who would rip his body apart through flogging to where vital organs would have been exposed. Then they took him and they pinned him to a cross. And the thing about the crucifixion is what would happen is you would end up suffocating and dying. Every time you needed to take a breath what you would do is you would push up on your feet and you would breathe and then you'd come back down and you'd push up and you'd breathe because you were suffocating on the cross. Which is why the two men next to Jesus, the guards got tired of waiting, right? The sky is turning black because they're murdering God. And, and so what ends up happening is they just break their, their legs and they break their legs so they can no longer push up on it and they suffocate and die. But they didn't need to break the bones of Jesus because Jesus had already given up his spirit. He said, it is finished. And not only that, another fun fact, it was actually a prophecy that no bone in his body would be broken. And so they did not break his bone, ironically. No, it's not ironic, okay? Because God said it wouldn't happen, right? No bone was broken. And so instead of breaking his bones, you know what they did? Just to make sure, to make sure, 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 like straight up pulse, not breathing, okay? But we still got to make sure that he, this guy's going to kind of be dead, dead, right? Because listen, because if a Roman executioner killed somebody, executed somebody, and that person lived through it, the executioner was killed. So they took a spear and they drove it through his side and it pierced his heart sack, which is why blood and water poured out from his side. He was killed by professionals. Make no mistake about it, he was dead. He was dead. The fourth point, Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. His body couldn't have gone far. This is also important. Because there'd be some who'd be like, well, maybe they took it to Las Vegas and you know, buried it out in the sand. And who knows? That's why they couldn't find the body. No, no, no. Listen. They couldn't have gone far. And there's several reasons that they couldn't have taken the body far. Because A, they're Jews, right? And so because they were Jews, what did the text say? The Sabbath was looming. You couldn't touch a dead body. You had to bury him, and you had to bury him quick. And so Joseph of Arimathea gives up his tomb, and they bury him there. There was a lot of factors at play. They needed to get him down from the cross. They needed to clean him. They needed to wrap him. Then they needed to go to Pilate and ask Pilate, can we take the body, get permission from him? And, and they're rushing this whole process to get Jesus buried in a tomb. And, and the reason I bring that up and I highlight that is because there were a lot of people who didn't like Jesus. 
namely the religious folk, namely the people who felt like their entire religious system was being dismantled by this man. And so they called for false trials to get him crucified because they wanted him out of there. Why? Because people by the droves were coming to know and fall in love with Jesus. People were um, saying, okay, kind of the, the, the Judaism thing is, is cool and all, but, but we have no more need for a sacrificial system because Jesus is uh, going to be sacrificed for us once and for all. People were following Jesus. And so check this out. If Jesus had not risen from the dead... This is something they would have exposed. They would, they would, it would be easy for them, right? Everybody's claiming, Jesus is resurrected. Did you know he is risen? Yada, 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 right? Oh, okay. Well, let me just go get his body and parade it through town to prove you wrong. But they could not. As a matter of fact, there's actually no historical, trustworthy documentation that refutes the things that I'm saying. And the fifth point is Jesus appeared uh, physically. Yeah, you can't really get around that one. All right? It's like, maybe he hid the body. No, the body's right there. He's talking. Okay? It's like, sorry, bro. You're out of, you know? And the great thing is, is it wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, because this is how cults start, right? Well, the angel appeared to me in my room by myself in a dark corner, and I had to put on special goggles, and I saw him, and he told me this, and now I'm telling everybody. Now, listen, Jesus, that wasn't the way this went down. Jesus appeared for 40 days risen from the dead. Jesus appeared to Mary and she clung to him. Jesus appeared to the disciples and they clung to his feet. Jesus made them breakfast on the beach. Jesus appeared to a crowd of over 500 people as risen from the dead. There was no refuting the fact that Jesus Christ had risen. Because he was there, he was alive and you could... See him. You could touch him. Listen to this account, encounter with his disciple Thomas. One of the twelve. Thomas is synonymous with doubt. Stinks for him. Um, but it says, now Thomas... Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So Jesus had first uh, appeared to the disciples and he began to interact with them, but Thomas wasn't there. And the other disciples then told him, they said, we've seen the Lord. We've seen him. He's risen from the dead. And so Thomas says to them, mm, unless I see his hands and the prints of the nails, and I put my finger into the print of the nails, and I put my hand into his side where they drove that spear through, unless I do those things, I will not believe you. Okay, translation, you're out of your mind, okay? I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And the crazy thing with Thomas, it wasn't like a seeing is believing thing for him, is it? He's like, I don't even just need to see, I need to touch. I need to feel. And maybe you're here this morning and you're that kind of person. You're very skeptical, you're going, oh, I'm very analytical, I don't know if this really happened kind of thing. Neither did Thomas, so it's okay, right? A Thomas didn't. Thomas didn't want just um, visual evidence. Thomas wanted to touch and to feel, but check this. Uh, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and he stood in their midst, and he said this, Peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, singles him out here, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here and, and put it into my side. Jesus says this to him. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. That's where some of you are here this morning. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered, and this is what Thomas's response to this encounter was. Thomas answers and he says, um, My Lord, my God! Exclamation point. My Lord, my God. And Jesus responded by telling Thomas, if you believe because you see, blessed are those who believe and they have not seen you and I. Those of us who are gathered here this morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus says you're blessed because you believe and you have not seen. Point number six. 
I got like 50 of these. No, no, I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right? I never tell you how many points because then people are like, he spent a lot of time on that point. This is going to go really long. No, it's not. Okay? I'm going to land the plane here soon. Uh, six, Jesus' resurrection was a historically a documented event. Jesus' resurrection was penned, this is important, shortly after it happened. That's important because we have a lot of historical documents, not just religious ones, but just history, period. We've got a lot of documents that pen history, and we have them penned by people that are penning them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after it happened. And we're penning, we're writing, and we just believe it. How do you know George Washington is the first president of the United States? Well, we learned about it in history. I read it in a history book. Who wrote the history book? Some history teacher. Oh, okay. Did the history teacher know him? Did they see him? Oh, no. But we believe that. Full stop. That's the truth. Well, the Bible could be full of errors. It was written by men. So was the phone book. But that doesn't mean it has a bunch of errors in it, okay? The Holy Spirit inspired men who penned this historical event. They penned this historical event. And this is the beauty of it. It was shortly after it happened. And this is why that's important. Because they penned it shortly after it happened, if it was not true, there were people who were eyewitnesses that were alive, that lived it, who could have come back and said, that, that didn't happen. What are you talking about? I'll take you to the grave site right now. That, that, that didn't happen. You want me to dig up the bones? I mean, it, it for sure didn't happen. But it could not be refuted because they could not find his bones because his bones were not there because Jesus is risen. Seven. The early church celebrated the resurrection. This isn't this like new age kind of pseudo spiritual. Oh yeah, you know, we just kind of like believe Jesus rose from the dead. We just kind of made that up while we were smoking peyote over in the desert. No, that's not what happened. The, the, the early church has always celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not a new thing. Jesus is risen. Eighth point. His own family worshipped him as God. Listen, his siblings were super reluctant. I don't know if you've read the Gospels. Like, can you imagine that? Though? Like, your, your brother never does anything wrong. He never gets into trouble. It's always your fault. I would probably resent him. Okay? And that was your story? Because your brother's God in the flesh? You're just kind of like, oh, man. You, and so, but they were so reluctant until he rose from the dead. <laughs> then after Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, listen, they not only followed him, but they were leaders in the early church. They wrote two books of the Bible, James and Jude. These guys full stop worshiped their brother as God after he rose again from the dead, validating everything that he had ever talked about. Nine, the transformation of his disciples. Listen, nine and ten, to me, that's it, right? This is like the most clear evidence of, of Christ's resurrection for me personally. The transformation of his disciples. You see, his, his disciples were fearful. At, when Jesus was being crucified, they were hiding. Okay? Peter's by a little fire and a, and a girl's like, Hey, aren't you with the Nazarene over there? No, no, no. I don't, I don't know him. Just shut up about that. Don't talk about you know, And just like, no, I'm pretty sure you're... No, no, I don't know him, little girl. You know, he's just... He, in fear, he's denying his knowledge of Jesus. How does somebody go from being so fearful of a little girl to being so bold and courageous with regards to preaching the message of salvation? So much so that he would stand before magistrates and rulers and he would look them in the eyes and he would say to them, should I obey you or God? We're going to imprison you. We threaten you with death. Should I fear you or should I fear God? It's not the same guy. This is not the same uh, person. <laughs> point number 10. Furthermore, they were put to death for the most part. They were put to death. Listen, this is important. People do not die for a lie that they know is a lie. They don't die for a lie they know is a lie. People die for lies every day in this country. 
and around the world. There are people who will fly planes into buildings, our buildings. There are people who will blow themselves up. There are people who will drink Kool-Aid. There's people who do all kinds of stuff in the name of religion because they have faith that what they believe is true. And because I believe it's true, I'll live that radical for my belief. The disciples didn't have faith as we do. They didn't need it because they saw him resurrected from the dead. And if it were a lie, there's no way all of them are dying for that. There's no way. They go back and they live their lives and they do their thing, but, but because they saw him, they touched him, they dialogued with him, they ate with him after he was killed, and they watched him ascend into heaven. Yes. Nothing could move them. Nothing could stop them. And the last point, say that, there was 11. If I would have told you 11 at the beginning, you'd have been like, oh my gosh, how long are we going? Um, <laughs> lastly, um, it's what I made uh, mention to earlier. Sec the, the greatest secular historians of the time documented the resurrection. For some of you, you're like, Seca what? Secular means non-Christian. These people were not Christian. They were not followers of Jesus, and yet they were some of the greatest historians of their time. Josephus, Suetonius, Plyde the Younger, all of these individuals who, who wrote, they were journalists, and they all confirmed this historical event. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 it says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection from the dead? But if there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if this is true, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Verse 19, if not Christ in Christ, we have hope in this life only. Then we are all of all people to be most pitied. If all we do is have hope and faith in this life, and we do not have that hope, that assurance, that security, that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death, rose again from the dead, and that we are going to live forevermore with Him. If, if that is not the message we preach, you should pity yourself. And I bring that up for this simple reason. If you are a Christian, or claim to be a Christian in this place this morning, and you do not believe in the resurrection, might hurt. You're not a Christian. Just let that sink in for a moment. There are things we can disagree on <coughs> theologically. We, we minor on the minors. This is not a minor. Mm -hmm. This is not a minor. If you do not believe, this is like a vegan eating steak. It just doesn't make any sense, right? It, that's, that's not the way it goes. This is like Nick's and good basketball in the same sentence. That just doesn't, just time out, one second, pause, prophecy alert. Knicks are going to win the championship next year. But, unpause, they are terrible right now, and they have been for over a decade. Okay, so, so point being, point being, it is an oxymoron to say, I am a Christian, but I do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, the Apostle Paul reinforces that reality in Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9 where he said that there is no salvation without belief in a literal, physical resurrection. If the work of the cross had ended with Jesus still dead, we would have no hope. <laughs> but because Christ rose, his life, his ministry, his promises, his sacrifices, it was all validated. It was all validated. First Peter, you know the dude denying... Jesus, by the little fire, the little girl. Okay, that Peter append a first Peter chapter one, verse three. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ 
who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, listen, there is no hope. There is no Savior. There is no salvation. There is no hope of eternity. Apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus is just another good but dead man. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death has lost its sting. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, sin no longer rules and reigns over us. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have the promise of eternal life. We don't just know about eternal life, we possess it. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours in Christ Jesus. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our sin, which was as scarlet, is now been made as white as snow. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our inheritance is incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, but is kept for us by the power of God in heaven. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have not just hope, but living hope. Because our Savior is living. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God. The resurrection confirms our justification. It confirms our justification. Which means, because you're also thinking, justify what? Listen, it, it is to say when God looks at you, He sees you as clothed in the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that uh, He, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you and I, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. We have a hope, we have a, a hope, a living hope, and, it, and our hope is, is living because it's not circumstantial, in other words. We don't have a hope that's just kind of like, well, you know, well, I just, I really, I hope I get the job, I, I mean, I really hope I get that promotion, but, you know, I might not. But I hope, well, you know, I just, I really hope he asks me out this weekend. I've been kind of waiting for that. Um, uh, but he might not. But I hope, right? Oh, man, I really hope it doesn't rain because we got a lot of food out there and we want a barbecue, right? <laughs> but it might, okay? And then we're going to be eating in here and Jacob will be out there in the rain. <laughs> Praise God. Um, I just, I really hope I get to go to heaven. I hope I get to go to heaven. But I don't know if I will, but I hope that's not our faith. That's not, that's not, that's not Christianity. That is not what we believe. You see, um, our hope was assured the moment the Father raised the Son. Our hope was assured the moment the Father rolled the stone away. Our hope was assured um, because we don't serve a dead God, but a living God, present tense, and He will be alive forevermore. That is the God that we serve. And I want to close with this brief story. Uh, Max Lucado, um, who writes a lot of books on leadership, he actually wrote a, um, uh, an account of a story of a missionary uh, in Brazil who went to reach um, an unreached tribe. They had never heard the gospel. They were there. They were living uh, in this remote jungle there in Brazil. And so this uh, missionary ended up having to cross this massive river to get to them. And he crossed and he was there. And what he quickly realized is that the people there in that, 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 that native, these, these natives, they were dying. They had a disease that was killing them. There was a hospital that wasn't very far, far off. They could have got there, but they were too afraid to cross the river because they believed that there were evil spirits that inhabited the, the river, and so we can't go into the river, so we'll just stay here and die. And they were every day, people were dying every day. And so the missionary begins to plead with them. And he says to them, listen, no, there's no evil spirits in the way. It's just a river. It's water. Please come with me. And he, he brings them down to the water, and he reaches into the water. and he, Look, my hand's in the water. I'm not dying. I'm okay. Okay? No, we don't. You stay away from us. We don't believe you. We don't believe what you're doing there. It's got to be like voodoo or something like that. And all of a sudden, he gets into waist deep. And he's there. He's waist deep in the water. And he's like, look, I'm splashing my face. It's, you're not going to die. You need to get across the river or you are going to die because there's a hospital and there's a cure. 
come on. Still, reluctancy, no, no thank you. I don't think, no, I'm not going, I'm not going there. We're not doing that. And so he then plunges underwater, all the way under, and he comes up on the other side, and he pumps his fist victoriously. Look, I've crossed the river. Nothing ha has happened to me. And um, this tribe begins to then rejoice and celebrate, and they all kind of run across the river. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He entered the river of death and came out the other side so that we mo may no longer fear death, but find eternal life. There is a way, and Jesus has made that way for you. Will you take hold of that? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks this. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? See, there's hope for you this morning. And I don't know where you're at. Maybe for some of you, you're like, yeah, you know, I've, I've kind of... I grew up in a Christian home. I had gone to church, and sometimes I still occasionally go to church, but I just kind of, stuff's just gone sideways, man, and, and I'm not where I know I need to be. That's okay. You're in the right place, and there's hope for you. But you still have to answer that question. Do you believe? Do you believe the orthodoxy of Christianity that Jesus Christ left heaven on a rescue mission for your soul. He lived that perfect life that you and I, we couldn't do it. We, we make mistakes. We say things we ought not. We, we do things that we shouldn't. And even when we say the right things and we do the right things, it's the motive of our hearts that condemn us. But Jesus came and He, he lived that perfect life for you, in your place, as a substitute, the Bible calls it. So that when He was sacrificed on the cross... He took on the wrath of God for the sins of the world. So that, he made it super simple, if you just believe in him. To believe means to trust, to follow, to obey. If, you, if you'd put your trust in Jesus, you would have eternal life. You don't have to run a marathon. You don't have to climb a mountain. You don't have to even, check this out, good news, you don't even have to be a better person. He says, come as you are. He's been the better person. And He gives His life for yours. Will you receive it? Do you believe it? Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Father, thank You for Your Word.